Partition global address space languages have been used in many different applications. Typically, problems though that have these patterns of irregular communication, irregular synchronization, that is asynchronous computation. And I'm going to talk about three of them that have specifically been written in UPC++. And the three that I'll talk about are reflect some of the different application domains and types of irregularity that appear in some of the applications. The first one is SIMPAC, which is a sparse symmetric matrix solver. The second one is SIMCOVE, which is an agent-based simulation of lungs that have been subjected to COVID. And the last one is Metahitmer, which is a genome assembler for metagenomes. Sparse direct solvers such as SIMPAC are very different than iterative solvers you may be more familiar with. And there are dependencies between the blocks that occur because of the, say, Gaussian elimination style computation that proceeds from the upper left corner and then down to the rightmost corner. And what happens in a sparse matrix, though, is this turns into a tree of dependencies because not every element of the matrix is filled in. And so it turns into this much, much more irregular sort of computation. The key step in a multifrontal version of a solver, which is one of the, the styles that are used for these sparse linear solvers, involves a set of frontal matrices. And a frontal matrix, if you look at the, the right child matrix down here at the bottom, is going to be a little factorization step where you're computing F11 and use that to then compute F21 and F12. And then those two, the, the column and row matrices are multiplied together to do an update of the trailing matrix block, which is F22. And that F22 matrix is considered the cont contribution matrix, whereas the other three are the, uh, are the factor matrices. And F22 needs to be used to update then its parent in the elimination tree. That is the other things that will depend, depend on the output of that, those, the multiplications that will need to happen there. And the, the update that happens then is an addition of what has already been multiplied in this right child, for example, and also in the left child into the parent matrix. Now the parent matrix has a superset of all the indices in the two children. And so if you look at the left child here, here for an example, you can see that these elements of the left child matrix are going to actually be, which have been multiplied, are going to be uh, spread out throughout the parent matrix. Uh, in different locations because there may be other non-zeros that are in the parent matrix that don't exist in the left child. And so those little blue dots are being spread out um, and then being added to, updated um, into the parent matrix. So this happens on very much of a demand-driven uh, set of processes through the computation. That is, there's not bulk synchronous steps in which a, a whole set of matrix multiplies are being driven. and in UPC++, we use the RPC mechanisms, and I should mention that this application is being written by a number of other people. I wasn't involved in this particular project, um, but you see the names and the reference to the paper at the bottom. So these updates then are done using a, uh, an operation that was implemented in UPC++ that's called extend add. It's called extend add because it's doing an addition of these matrices into the parent matrix, but also the, ma the parent is extended beyond the index space of the child. So what does this extend add look like? Well, data is binned uh, into destinations based on the processors, and I should also say the color coding on here indicates that there are it, each one refers to a different processor. So this is a 2 by 3 processor grid, and the sparse matrix is distributed in a 2D block cyclic manner. So you can see, for example, in the upper uh, block of the parent, F11, that all six colors are represented. So each of the six processors has one of those blocks of F21, reminding you that each one of these things is sparse. Uh, and the block cyclic layout, you can then see the repeated pattern if you look at the union of all of those blocks in the parent matrix, for example, or in the others. Obviously, this, the, some of the child matrices it may be smaller, and therefore they're distributed over a smaller subset of the processors. For example, the the, the child matrix on this particular slide just has two processors that are involved in the computation and therefore also in the communication. So traditional MPI implementations use an MPI all to all V, so a variable length MPI collective call. And um, there are also versions of this in some of the multifrontal solvers that use the I send and I receive in order to get some more asynchrony into the computations. 
In the UPC++ implementation, this computation and the updates are done with an RPC, where the RPC sends a child contribution, so one of the things from this child matrix, say the blue dots there, up into the, uh, in, into the parent matrix, or in the case of the arrows that you see on the right-hand side of this picture, the red arrows, you've got the green dots all being used to update the parent matrix. The RPC then does a callback um, that compares the indices and does the accumulation, uh, accumulates the contributions into the target matrix. So it does, it figures out where those, each of those green dots is supposed to go into the uh, storage space of the parent, which is not necessarily contiguous because of the increased index set that's in the parent, and then those additions are done. One of the nice things about the RPC is that it happens serially on a single processor core, and so, or on a, in a single RPC++ rank, sorry, UPC++ rank, and therefore you don't have to worry about some of the tricky synchronization that might come up in a, in a straight shared memory sort of code with just reads and writes. So what kind of performance do we get? Uh, does the team get out of this? They, this shows the UPC++ performance just for the um, extend add operation, and this is run on a particular matrix, a sparse matrix from a benchmark suite that you can see the name there. And uh, you can see that this scales quite well up to uh, about 2K uh, cores. It really, the, the performance levels off quite a bit at, um, at about 1K, but, ne but nevertheless, it does scale quite well from a uh, performance endpoint. And the UPC++ version that is written with RPCs, which is the pink line, is significantly faster than either the MPI, uh, either of the MPI versions, the one that's point to point with I send and I receive, or the MPI all to all version. It's about um, 1.8 times faster than the MPI all to all version, for example. This is on a different machine. The previous one was on the Haswell nodes of the Nurse Cori system. This was on the Knight's Landing processors. You see a similar behavior here, um, even better sort of linear scaling of the, of the UPC++ implementation. And um, the speed up overall is about 1.6 relative to the MPI all to all version. So that's just one of the up, that's the main update set, uh, set that step that's inside of the sparse direct solver, so inside of Simpack. And this just gives you a little bit of, of a idea of the complexity then of these kinds of sparse solvers. They are very uh, difficult to write because of the asynchronous nature of these updates that are happening. And it, just because of the sparsity structure, even if you try to write it in, say, an MPI uh, model with collective communication, you still end up with lots of data structure movement and um, packing and, and, and unpacking data to get to the different parts of the sparse version of the matrix. So the, in this case, the way the, the sparse matrix solver proceeds, so this is actually a symmetric sparse solver, and that further complicates the way the indexing has to happen because you don't store both, of the, uh, both halves of the matrix. Um, the notifications happen using an RPC, what's called an RPC FF, and that enqueues um, a global pointer into the, to the data, and then it manages the dependency count. So in this elimination tree, which is the tree structured computation in a sparse matrix solver, in a sparse direct solver like this, the, the, chi the two children, of course, have to be available before you're going to or um, update the parent. And so keeping track of whether all of the dependencies have been resolved is part of what is, happens inside of the UPC++ data structures. When all the data is available, the task is moved into the available wait list. You can see these different queue lists here. And then the data is, um, can be moved to the, uh, the receiving processor using an rget. And when all the data has been transferred, the ta task is then moved to the ready list, and the task actually can execute. And that's where the computation is performed. So Simpack, um, this shows the, the performance of Simpack on um, some other examples here. The matrix in this case is distributed by super nodes, and um, these, which are these l larger blocks of non-zeros that are in the matrix. And the, um, there's both a, a 1D distribution, which has been the more traditional way that Simpack was originally written. And uh, it balances the floating point operations and the memory utilization very effectively, but it doesn't give you such good strong scalability. Its new 2D implementation, which you can see here in the picture, uh, has not, which has not yet been published though, has explicit load balancing 
and um, does not just use a regular block cyclic mapping. It gives you both load balancing in terms of memory and, flo and floating point operations and much finer grain task granularity, which leads to the better scalability. Uh, you see the, about a, a 3x speed up um, on one of the matrices called C uh, Serena, on the, and these are both on Corey Haswell, the, those, the Haswell nodes, and uh, about 2.25x speed up on this um, other matrix. So UPC++ enables this finer granularity task graph to be fully utilized. It allows you to really build that distributed data structure directly with these global pointers and then makes it easier to do the bookkeeping necessary both for the dependencies calculations to make sure that, that the sub dependence computations have been completed, but also then to do the updates into the various sparse data structures. Here's one, uh, another um, graph looking at the uh, running time on another matrix for um, it's running on the, the Cori KNL system, and this shows the uh, SIMPAC 1D and 2D implementation. So the 2D implementation, this is running time, so the pink line is the best, which is the SIMPAC 2D implementation. It also compares to one of the state-of-the-art sparse solver libraries um, called Pastiques, and that is the green line here at the top. So you can see that we're that the UPC++ implementation is outperforming Pastiques as well. And this is just an, for another matrix uh, that we had looked at earlier, but also doing a comparison to Pastiques, and here the speed up relative to that is about a factor of two. UPC++ provides both productivity and performance advantages for these very complicated sparse direct solvers such as SIMPAC. The productivity really comes from the RPC mechanism, which allows the programmer to, to pro use a very simplify notify wait system where a, a task that is dependent on another set of tasks gets a notification that those subtasks have completed and then can go and get the data from it when it's ready to do the computation on that data. It interoperates with MPI, UPC, that which made it possible to incrementally build the SIMPAC application, which originally started as an MPI application. And the non-blocking API makes it very natural then to express overlapped communication. The reduced communication costs come from very, very low overhead communication that really derives from the GasNet implementation, and that therefore the ability to have fine-grained communication such as uh, occurs in the two-dimensional version of the solver where the messages are much smaller than the 1D version, and that in UPC++ you can support those fine-grained computations, communication events which give you then better scalability overall from the 2D algorithm. The overlap of communication is expressed by these asynchronous uh, events as well as futures and the increased efficiency then which shows up even in just the looking at a single update step in this extend add operation. And we also showed that it outperforms then the state of the art sparse symmetric solvers. More information is available at the URL here if you're interested either in the code or in, for example, the publication that I mentioned earlier. This next case study is an application still under development, and it's a scientific team that is a collaboration between Steve Hoffmeyer at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, who has led the UPC++ parallelization effort, and the scientific applications team led by researchers at the University of New Mexico and Arizona State University. So this has been developed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and I think the speed with which this application, a fairly complex distributed memory application, was uh, developed is really a testament to the productivity of UPC++. So a little bit of background here on the problem involved. Um, as you have, I'm sure know, the immune response is an important piece of determining the outcome of patients, that is how well a patient that ha is, has COVID-19 is going to fare in response to the disease. What most you hear about mostly in the news is about the antibodies. And the antibodies are a very important part of the immune system, but not the only part of it. The antibodies only can stop a virus that is outside of the host cells. Once the virus has actually gotten inside of the cell, which of course is what the virus is, is doing in order to attack this, the organs in the body and so on, the, the, it's the job of the T cells, another part of the immune system, to attack the virus. And so understanding how the T cells detect and clear the virus is really fundamental to understanding how the disease is going to progress and whether it's going to be resolved in a particular patient. So to investigate this, 
the, the, the SimCove application was written to, by building a, a 3D agent-based model where the agents in this case are going to be the viruses and the T cells and they're going to be, it's going to be a detailed three-dimensional model of the lungs. So this just gives you a quick overview of what SimCove looks like in terms of the implementation and also the goals of the project. So the goal is to model the entire lung, which is very large um, because we want to do it, they want to do it at the cellular level. So there are about 100 billion epithelial cells, those are the surface cells of the lung, and the, there are about 100, hundreds of millions of these T cells that they're then we're trying to model in terms of the behavior of the T cells under a viral attack. The lungs itself has very complicated branching or fractal structure, which you can see in the lower right image and is well known in terms of the, the, the structure of the lungs. And what that means is a traditional, say, continuous style of simulation would have boundaries everywhere in the simulation. And so instead, we're using, the, the team is using an agent-based simulation. The time resolution is in seconds. So we've got cells that we're trying to model and seconds that we're trying to model them at. And we want to, and the simulation, the goal is to run it on an entire lung for 20 to 30 days so that you can really look at the progression of a patient over a period of time in the illness. SimCove is written in UPC++ and it uses a distributed 3D spatial grid. It really, the particles then, which are the agents in the simulation, such as the T cells, are a move over time and the computation then once they've moved into their position is localized on a given processor. The load balancing actually is a very tricky problem because of the movement of the particles. There's a lot of activity near an infection if this, the infection just starts in a particular part of the lung and then spreads out early on. There's only going to be a lot of activity where there are those particles, that is where the infection is, and then where the T cells are, will also congregate. So that leads to a load balancing problem, which is still some work that's ongoing. UPC++, in terms of why was this chosen and how, how was it useful, it heavily uses RPCs in this application. As you can imagine, as an agent moves over, it's easy to do that with a UPC, uh, with an RPC, sorry, and to then have the other processor that receives that agent to pick it up and do the computation on it. It was very easy to develop the first prototype of this, and it, it produces fairly good distributed memory performance that avoids um, a lot of synchronization using the same semantics of RPCs that I've already talked about, namely that one of when one of the RPCs is executing on the remote side, you don't have to worry about synchronizing with other threads other um, within that, that particular rank. And there's extensive support then for asynchrony that improves the um, overlap of communication and computation, very much like what I talked about in SIMPAC in terms of some of the advantages in this computation. But it's a fairly different application. So this is what some of the main components look like in, in the simulation. So these are the different types of agents that you see on the left-hand side, such as the viruses, um, the epithelial cells, and then you see the T cells and so on and some of the other, other details. And each of these has a little state machine that has it moving from, for example, a, he a healthy cell into one that's incubating the virus into expressing it and then becoming apoplectic, ap apoptotic and, um, and then uh, dying because of the invasion of the, the T cell, which not only kills the virus, but also kills the entire cell in order to get rid of the virus. And without reading through all of the details of this, you can see a fairly complicated, say, control pattern and where the, how this computation behaves, depending on whether there's a virus in that particular region of the lung, and then what, where the T cells are at in terms of attacking the virus and the cell and so on. So this just gives you some idea of the, the kinds of output um, that has been, they've seen from the simulations. And this is really kind of a model problem. It's a speculative simulation to just explore how the simulation is progressing. And the code has been validated against a previous two-dimensional version of the code that was, was, was not for distributed memory, so couldn't run the sort of large-scale 3D computations that, that this code can, can run. What we're looking at at the top is a mild infection of the 
of the virus and there's a very high T cell response. So it's important to look at the axes when you're comparing the top and the bottom graphs. And so I've drawn a little line here that corresponds to the, uh, the corresponding location of say the top of the Y axis here in the viral load that that first red arrow corresponds to something fairly low um, below. And so the, the viral load is going up very rapidly in both cases over a period of about five days. And in the first case, if you see on the right hand, in the top right hand corner, the T cells are increasing dramatically, getting up to this um, 25,000. And that is, um, whereas on the bottom, uh, although it also looks like there's a dramatic increase, the top there, the axis is only tops out at 600. And so the T cell response in the bottom is much lower. And as a result, although it does dampen down the viral load, it, um, and you see that, that peak on the left-hand side in the bottom, it comes down to a trough and then shoots up again because um, the infection was not really eliminated. So this is the kind of output that we get. One of the other complications, by the way, in this code is bringing in the use of observational data in order to improve the resolution of the model. And the observational data is being used in three different ways. First of all, to figure out the parameters of the model, such as the, the rate of viral production by the infected cells. So the cells, as you know, the virus will multiply as it um, infects these cells. It takes advantage of the mechanism in the cell to reproduce itself. And exactly how that, that behaves differs by disease. So there's a model built in based on these um, imaging data of the lungs in, in a COVID-19 patient in order to uh, obtain those parameters. In order to validate the model, then the simulation is run and it, it's compared against an actual um, COVID-19 infected patient um, with some of the specific parameters that are examined there. And it's also then used to sort of seed the model. That is, um, where, how, what's a reasonable starting point? Do you just have one virus in one particular location or do you have a, a set of viral particles spread throughout the lungs? So you're also looking at these, these patients to try to determine what is a typical load look like as the disease is just starting to, to form in the, in the body. And this last slide, if we can get this visualization to work here, is going to show the visualization of this in three dimensions. And this is just a tiny little piece of the lung. So this is not looking at the full lung. And you're seeing the, um, the virus spread in this case. And um, you'll see it now sort of oscillate as the um, viral load and the T cells are kind of working against each other um, and then now getting to the edges of the cube. So this is just a little, a little three-dimensional cube with one of the sacs um, of the, uh, the lung in it. So as I said, I think a very exciting pro way, use of a UPC++ to solve a really timely and critical problem and really understand the immune response to COVID-19.